Rabbi Hertz. Good yom to everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Rabbi Itzinger, for this warm title. Dear friend of Getzel Itzinger, um, it's nice to see some people from my hometown, London. It's really a pl pleasure and privilege being here tonight. And uh, for you tonight, for us today, for us it's still, it's all Laila Chiyam Yair, it's Yom Tov Yutas Kislev. It's a day the Rebbe actually, Memtes, I remember, said good Yom Tov, and the Rebbe acknowledged this as a special Yom Tov, which was started by Chassidim, but the Rebbe took it as one of the greatest days in Lubavitch and for the world and for worldwide. It's a real honor and privilege to share the platform with someone so dear and special to every Chassid and to every Jew in the world, someone so remarkable and unbelievable who has a schus, which as Rabbi Itzinger mentioned, and show, which we can't even describe of being there at the right time, the right moment, and giving his life up to the Rebbe on an unreal way. What today I want, and it's, uh, I want to accomplish, I just want to say as follows. Um, personally, I've known Dr. Weiss, uh, every Bokhre Labavich, who has been there for many years by the Rebbe. Dr. Weiss is an icon. Dr. Weiss, he asked me before how we should dress. And I said, one thing we remember you with the Rebbe is the hat. Dr. Weiss is wearing the same hat he wore by the Rebbe by Kofis every year. And throughout, since 1975, that is the hat which we all remember Dr. Weiss with. But I want to say is that in my years as I came to Chicago, I had a new privilege to actually get to know Dr. Weiss. As you know, Dr. Weiss was the uh, start, the connection, which I'll explain in a second, which brings us to the actual story of Rosh Chodesh Kislev, grew up in the Bnei Ruvain under Rabbi Shusterman, who I, my predecessor, I took over. And really, it's, it's um, and he was one of his prized special Talmudim. Over the years, I've, I've had a schuss to hear Dr. Weiss many times, shared many personal simchas and simchas, community simchas, which I can relate later, with Doctor and his his wife, his Aishas Chayel Myra, and it's um, really a privilege. I think that we are one of the uh, only places who actually honored the Weisses. I know they refused the honor of the Rebbe's for doing for the Rebbe because he said it's only a schus. But tied in when Rabbi Shusterman passed away, the, the Rabbi Herschel Shusterman Award. We had a dinner attended over 500 people, and it's nothing compared to what the Weisses have done. So uh, without this Hagdama, I want to say is there is, there is no words to describe the, the, the schus. What I want to do to begin the, the, the program is to lead everyone up to a piece, which I personally heard from Rabbi Shusterman many times and from, from Rabbi Krinsky many times, the story leading up to Dr. Weiss in a nutshell, and then Dr. Weiss maybe will take over, and that's how maybe we can proceed in the program. What I wanna say is everyone on this phone call, everyone on the Zoom, and um, Zoom connects us, as the Rebbe said to us, connects us all over the world, which is special. It's in a way, with, with our struggling times, it's an unbelievable moment that we can get connected. And it's interesting, the Rebbe also said that the first talks of Chastaira, the, the, the power of technology that connects us. So the Rebbe brought up this idea. We're able to actually connect in ways which we couldn't do before. So let me start off as follows. On Simchas Taira, Lamed Ches, the story of Shemina Seres Simchas Taira, I'm not going to elaborate on. We all know that the Rebbe wasn't feeling well. We all know what happened in the Hakafis of Lamed Ches. And the unbelievable, um, the Rebbe finished off the Hakafas with a heart attack, the seventh Hakafa. The Rebbe made Kiddush in the Sukkah, not on grape juice, but on wine, because it showed the, the importance of a minic. And the Rebbe actually went to the room, and then the Rebbe did not want to go to the hospital. At 5.30, the Rebbe had a second heart attack, where Dr. Weiss will elaborate on that, but I want to get to my point, what I'm saying here. And that is, at that time, there was um, pressure from both the Maskiris and the Rabbanim even said that the Rebbe should go to the hospital. And when the Rabbanim came to tell the Rebbe, the Rebbe told them, you are rabbis, don't give a psak, an halachic verdict, because if you give a halachic verdict, I will have to listen. And the Rebbe did not want to go to the hospital. 
and there was a question of what to do because the doctors were all giving a uh, raising their hands and giving up hope and saying this is this, 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 that it's it's as serious as you can imagine, which Dr. Weiss will explain. At 5:30 in the morning, the rabbit sin was downstairs. There's two versions: either the, she came down or she was brought down, and she heard what the question was. And the rabbit sin and said an unprecedented uh, statement, which her, her dedication to the Rebbe, which it laid on the program, I'm sure Dr. Weiss will also share with us her dedication to the Rebbe, which he knew personally, there's nobody I think in, uh, in, in this context who knew the Rebbe so well and was so close to the Rebbe said one thing, that if my husband says that we, my husband never said something which was not clear, about by and just which was, we can speak, her bring a whole night, though on the Scotchress and her big. If I hurts, I, I will step in just to take over because the sound is not transmitting. But if I can just expand on what Rabbi Hurst was bringing out is that the uh, you, uh, you can hear me now. Okay. You can hear me now. You can, you can hear me. Dr. Weiss, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear very, very well now. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry for one second. So the uh, okay, the unprecedented and self-sacrifice was remarkable, as Rabbi. Um, as Rabbi, um, as the Rabbitson um, was going on, Rabbi Krinsky was walking into his room, and the Rabbitson, uh, the Rabbitson was following him. Rabbi Krinsky related that he heard sounds around to the Rabbitson. And the Rabbitson turns out, Rabbi Krinsky, mit I Contact him. All your contact can unite a doctor. And at that moment, he has flash in his head. Wanted to give the Rebbe Nachas and sent a, a, a book from Dr. Weiss, which will, Dr. Weiss will explain the phone right for it. It was totally dreaming. And finally, made a real decision. The most best decision, he said, it was the best halachi decision he made in his lifetime. He told me that many, many times. And that led to then to uh, the connection of a Krinsky with Dr. Weiss. And from here, I want to begin with the story. I will ask Dr. Weiss to begin as from the beginning of what happened then in that phone call and how it led to this unbelievable moment of you being there and having this mysterious nefesh for the Rebbe. Thank you, Rebbe, I heard. And I want to expand a little bit because the sound transmission, at least here in Chicago, was a little bit weak at times during Rebbe Hertz's uh, really careful understanding and review of the story. But basically, as uh, just to summarize what Rebbe Hertz said, is that the Rebbe laid down his firm belief that the best place for him to get his care would be at 770 and not to go to a hospital. And the Rebbitson was very, very much on board with him on this matter. She always knew him to be very rational and carefully thinking out matters. And even in the time of crisis, she felt that he had complete command of the idea that the best place for him would be at 770. He did not want to be transported to a hospital. To an ordinary doctor, this seemed like a very controversial position because uh, when one has a heart attack, there is the practical need to monitor the heart rhythm, to watch the vital signs very carefully with the proper equipment. 
none of which was available right at the moment at 770. And the doctors who were there in attendance were very kind hearted, only willing to help, but they knew from their experience that the common sense approach would be to transport such a patient to a hospital where all these measurements can be taken. And they're not trivial measurements. You know, sometimes a person with a heart attack can have a very bad heart rhythm that needs to be identified on the moment and intercepted on the moment. And if you don't have that on the moment interception and treatment, you sometimes have very, very bad outcomes. So the doctors were insistent that the Rebbe go. And I was being called at seven o'clock or so in the morning by Rebbe Klinsky on my emergency medical phone at home as I was preparing to go to Shoal that morning on Shemini at Saras, uh, unaware of anything that was happening, of course, till the phone call came. And Rebbe Klinsky's initial question was, the Rebbe has had such a bad night that his blood pressure no longer sustains his ability to talk with us. The pressure had sagged down so low. And we're now in a position where he's kind of not communicating. Do we have the privilege to override his firm request confirmed by Rebison Schneerson, his wife, that he wanted to stay there? Is it ethical to leave him in 770 when all the doctors around say that the only way you can get decent care when you're this sick is to be in the hospital where the equipment is for heart care, for coronary artery care, for, for arrhythmia care and all that. And I told Rabbi Krinsky, I was so sad to hear about the Rebbe. As a child, I only heard about the Rebbe. I never met the Rebbe, but I knew his greatness through Rabbi, Rabbi Herschel Schusterman, my Rav in Chicago. And as Rabbi Hertz referred to the Rav of B'nai Ruvain before Rabbi Hertz took over. And I said that it's a very hard question ethically to override a great Rebbe's opinion like this and its confirmation by his devoted wife. But I too agree that the Rebbe needs this kind of care. And I said that really the best solution might be to arrange the care for him at 770 as he requested. And I said in my own experience, in my training years in Boston, I saw occasions when famous people like heads of state or someone in charge of a major industry in America was treated this way in their private headquarters, kind of under secrecy so the public wouldn't be in on all the details. But I said, I saw my, my mentors who are professors and very capable people arrange this care. And I'll just mention some names of who was involved like this. The Baron Nisky Rothschild was treated like this. Uh, one of our heads of state in the United States was treated this way. But of course, in those circumstances, the whole resources of the Rothschild fortune was behind it or the whole resources of the United States government was behind it. And all this was not available to me in any way. In fact, I had no one that I knew of medically in New York at the time I took Rabbi Krinsky's call. So I told the rabbi, maybe you can find someone who could do this and make this kind of arrangement for the rabbi as for his request and for the confirmation of this request by Rabbi Sinchnerson. And Rabbi Krinsky put down the phone and several minutes later called back and said, Dr. Weiss, I looked all over, I looked all over, and there's no one here who could begin to help me on this matter or would even know where to begin to do this or have the resources and bring the equipment in on immediate no notice or even have the manpower to help to man such a setup. He said, on that basis, Dr. Weiss, can you leave right now from Chicago and come and see if you can do this? And I know full well, I was just a beginning practitioner. I was really in my first year or two of practice here in Chicago, having been having moved from Boston to Chicago to start my, my, my first year of, years of being a cardiologist in practice. I didn't know anyone to call in New York, but Baruch Hashem, I, I flashed, I, an idea flashed through my mind because one of my most devoted young teachers in Boston had become the head of cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And I decided just on the whim to make the phone call to Mount Sinai and as many of you would understand, making a call to a hospital usually gets you nowhere fast. This switchboard and that switchboard and press this button and do this and do that. And you don't even get the doctor. He's in a conference, he's in a procedure, he's got a sick patient, he's off today or whatever it might be the reason. You, you don't expect to make a phone call and get right to a doctor. But I spoke to a receptionist. And in those days, they didn't have switchboards like the modern electronic boards. They, they did patch cords. There was a manual switchboard at Mount Sinai in 1977. And this lady heard my voice, heard my plea for help. And she got out of her seat 
away from the switchboard, went down the hall to go to a dear teacher of mine, Dr. Louis Tischholz, and brought him, practically dragging him by the ear to come to the phone to talk to me because she could hear there was such an urgency. And Dr. Louis Tischholz is a giant of a man, is a cardiologist. He was one of the pioneers of echocardiography for the world. He was a most brilliant clinician and a very kind humanistic person, a Jew. He wasn't steeped in the practice of Judaism, but he certainly was well schooled in the human values of Judaism. And the Yohafta Warecha Kamocha is something by which he's always lived. He went right to work assuring me that he would do his best to try to come to New York because it would take me at least four or five hours to get from Chicago to New York. There was a, tri a long drive to the airport, parking in the airport, getting a plane right when I wanted it, getting off the plane two hours later in New York and then finding a way of transporting myself to, to Crown Heights with, with which I was unfamiliar. And so he promised that he would do his best to get the equipment together and begin to arrange care for the Rebbe while I was in this four or five hour trip from Chicago. I just couldn't believe my good fortune that he picked up the phone so fast and that the switchboard operator was so attentive that she ran down the hall and grabbed him by the ear and dragged him down the hall to the phone. But it was just an unbelievable act of chesed by God to have put the thought in to call the Mount Sinai Hospital and for me to have had a teacher like Dr. Louis Tischholz. Not only was he so kind to do this, and he had never met the Rebbe, I might want to add, he didn't know much about Lubavitch, but he was also the most gifted cardiologist in terms of his wisdom, his seichel, and his ability to put things together quickly and efficiently and effectively. So I didn't know that it would be such a break while I was on the, on the plane. All I could think of is it's like reading when you start davening on the plane, you're, you go through the beginning brachas and then you hit the akeda, akeda Yitzchak, and you hear Yitzchak asking his father innocently when you're reading the akeda. Father, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where is the sacrifice? How, how, how are we going to get through this? And I immediately thought of the pitfall I was in. I was going there without any idea of how we're going to effectively take care of the Rebbe out of the clear blue in New York at 770, a place I'd never, you know, not familiar with in a sense physically, and also not being aware of any other people besides Dr. Tischel's. And I wasn't even sure Dr. Tischels was going to be able to do so many things so fast. And I davened with the fullest kavana that I'd be helped in this matter, the way probably Avraham asked God in his heart for a favor of how to spare him the necessity to sacrifice his son Yitzchak. My name happened to be Yitzchak. So when I got off the plane, I ran over to the cab stand asking for a cabbie, asking for a cab to go to Crown Heights. And the dispatcher told me, Sir, we have not been allowed by the city of New York to send any cabs to, to Crown Heights because there was a recent murder in the neighborhood and there's such racial tension because of this murder that we can't let any cab drivers or any couriers take a, take a public vehicle or a public limousine into, into Crown Heights. No matter, what you, no matter what you want to offer us to pay us for the service, we just can't do it. We're not allowed to. They said the best thing you could do is probably go on the bus to Jackson Heights from LaGuardia and take two subways to get to Crown Heights. It'll probably take you at least two, two and a half hours. And I said, oh my gosh, this is not looking very good. The mission is not looking like it's gonna work out. I'll never get there in any kind of timely manner to help the Rebbe, let alone even get there in, in, proper, in a proper manner and proper state of mind. So I walked back into the airport thinking, maybe I'll just find some passenger who's getting off a plane or some person who can give me a ride privately. And as I walked in, I had at that time just the, the kippah on. I didn't have the, I just, I didn't have a, a hat like this that the Rebbe Hertz referred to. Um, but when I walked in, I was measly, immediately seized upon by the police. And they said, are you Dr. Weiss? And I said, oh no, they're probably going to apprehend me for making an illegal attempt to get a ride inside the airport, which is strictly against New York laws. And I said, I, I told the police officer, I really, I have a very bad assignment right now, a very difficult assignment. Please give me a chance to find a ride to Crown Heights. And the police officer introduced himself. It was a Jewish police officer. He said, I have been called by Rabbi Krinsky from Lubavitch who anticipated this problem. 
and I'm looking for you so we can give you a police escort on the double to get to Crown Heights. And I said, oh my gosh, not only did I reach Dr. Tischoltz in a flash, but as I walked back into the airport, it was about to be what I thought arrested for violating the law of getting an unauthorized courier. They're gonna transport me by police escort to New York to Crown Heights. And it was like a lightning fast trip. And I didn't even know exactly where Crown Heights was on the map, but I could recognize they were making good time through the streets of you know, Queens and then to Brooklyn and whatever. And when we got out, I saw a dense sea of black coats, people very, very forlorn, very, very, very saddened by an obvious crisis in their community with the Rebbe being critically sick. It looked like I wasn't gonna be able to get to the door because when the police opened the door, they were just smothered with people in the street, there was no opening. And to make matters worse, I, at that time at least, not now, I had a youthful appearance. Now I'm an old guy and I don't have a youthful appearance anymore. But in those days, I looked like I might be 10 years away from Bar Mitzvah. I was actually 33, but I looked maybe 10 years younger. So I looked like I was 23 at that time. And when I got out of the car, suddenly people took a look and they thought the great savior, Dr. Weiss is getting out of the car, but he looks like he just is out of the years of being a Bar Mitzvah. So there was such a, it was like you could almost hear the sigh of discouragement that here's a kid coming out of a car to help take care of the Rebbe, a person with no experience, no seho, no idea of how to get things done. So I could see right away that it wasn't a satisfied crowd. I didn't look like I was uh, at all quick for the job or old enough to take care of such a responsibility. And then to make matters worse, as the police kind of parted the Red Sea by making people separate to create a path for me, a very large Chabad, person literally leaped on me and I didn't know who he was and what he, what he was doing. Was he trying to jump over me and suppress me from getting to the Rebbe? I couldn't tell. And then he introduced himself as Mr. Rebbe, or Rebbe, Mr. Rebbe Koppelbacher from South Africa. And I said, the name sounds familiar. And then I remembered one or two years ago when we were newly married, we had gotten a call when we, when we were living in Cambridge, Massachusetts from a Koppelbacher whose wife was having a lot of trouble with a problem of being septic after delivering a baby in South Africa. And it was a whole long story, but I was able to find for her the chief of infectious disease at her South African hospital who saved her life. This doctor was not at the hospital when I made the call, but I knew of him because he was an outstanding world, world figure in infectious disease. And he was on a safari in Kenya. And with the help of my wife's um, apartment building where she was living before we got married, there was a lady by the same name of, as this doctor. And I said, maybe she's related to the doctor. So I called upon her and indeed it was her father. And by shortwave radio, the radio, they got him to put in his input to save Koppelbacher's wife. So it was a whole long geschichte, even walking into the door of 770. But I was so, in, I said, everything's happening right. Even meeting Koppelbacher, hearing that his wife was rescued and is doing very well and fully saved from the infection after her childbirth. And then getting to the door, and at the door was waiting for me, Rebison Schneerson. And she looked like the most gentle, dignified, refined lady. And even in the crisis, she was so composed. And she said, Dr. Weiss, it's Yom Tov today, it's Shmini Atzeres. Before you see my man, we should make Kiddush. And I said, Rebison, you don't understand. I have to see the Rebbe first, and then I'll come up and certainly make Kiddush for the Yom Tov. But I first have to see what's wrong. He said, so she said to me, Dr. Weiss, please be reassured that I met Dr. Tischel. He came right away from Mount Sinai Hospital. He brought all the necessary tools and equipment and he's restored my, my husband's blood pressure. He's now fully back to his full conversational capacity and the things are being stabilized beautifully. And I said, I can't believe my, what I'm hearing that not only that the, that the mission so far go on a good track, but even that the Reb is coming back so I was so relieved and we did make a brief kiddish and then I went down to meet the Rebbe. And I was just so grateful that it seemed like things were fitting into place and with, especially with Dr. Tischoltz there being the real hero of the case in terms of getting the job done medically. And Dr. Tischoltz and I sat with the Rebbe and explained to him what had happened to him, what was wrong. And almost like lightning, the Rebbe caught on to anything we would say medically. We described what a heart attack is physically, 
We described what the issue was mechanically. We described what needed to be done on the immediate and also in the immediate future. And the Rebbe was a full level of perception. And of course, he had the advantage of being a person trained in physics in Berlin by two Nobel laureates, both one of whom really attached to the Rebbe over the years, over the decades. That was uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who was very known for his wave equations for those of you who might know physics. And the other was uh, Nernst, I think it was Wilhelm Nernst. And um, these were his teachers in physics. Then he had teachers in mechanical engineering at the Sorbonne. So he understood everything we were saying about the mechanics of the heart. And he even came up with some brilliant ideas on the spot. This is on day one of the heart attack coming out of cardiogenic shock. So he described to us, he said, what do you do about the tissue that's not working when the rest of the heart is doing the contracting? And I said, well, we accept that. We want it to become scar tissue around which the rest of the heart will do its contracting work. And that will hopefully do the job if not too much of heart muscle is lost. And he said, Dr. Weiss, what about engaging the technology of stem cell research to convert these, these scarred cells, these, these dead cells back to heart muscle cells by the use of the technology of stem cell research. And I said, and Dr. Tischel said, we have not heard of stem cell research. We've, the term has come out, but it's not a common term in the, in the literature. And certainly in cardiology, no one has used any technology to restore these cells, which are gonna become scar tissue back into contracting muscle cells. You can have a whole contracting heart. And I saw in his office where in his, he had a drawer full of mag magazines that were nature, nature and science, two wonderful scientific publications for those of you who specialize in science. You know, these are very reputable journals. And the Rebbe was right along with you reading such journals and learning about stem cell research. The second thing he thought of right on the spot, this was probably on day two, he thought and thought and thought about his years as a child where he played with soap bubbles as a kid. And he said, you know, I always looked at soap bubbles with great interest that when you blew into them, they eventually were so stretched that the tension on the wall popped the bubble. And I said, Dr. Weiss, you probably had the same experience at birthday parties. Did you ever go to a birthday party with a balloon? I said, yes, I did. And when you blow too hard on a balloon, it, it gets more and more tension. It's harder and harder to blow the balloon up. And eventually, you know, the balloon doesn't even hold together. And the same thing when you acquire a car for the first time, you realize the necessity of keeping tire pressures right. And the more air you pump into the tire, the more it's stretched and the tighter the wall becomes, the, the rubber wall of the tire. The rubber reason that if you could bring the heart size down, you have much less tension on the wall of the heart. So any muscle that has to work will have an easier job. It's like saying to someone who has a weak arm, sir, you have a weak arm and you're working for me in the store. I'll give you lighter packages to lift to the higher shelves, which makes good sense. The rib came up with this idea. It was not a popular or common idea in cardiologists, in cardiology to retrain the heart to become smaller. So we gave the rib the advice to restrain from eating a lot of sodium and salt as might be the case in use of koshering and switch to foods that don't require koshering or extra salt so that he doesn't retain the fluid that would stretch out his heart and make the walls of the heart have to work harder because of all the, all the wall muscle tension. And so the Rebbe did this. It was a phenomenal strategy because the Rebbe had an extensive heart attack and he really capitalized on the part of the heart that was working by giving it the easiest assignment. I might also mention as a, doc as a doctor, you have to communicate to the patient's family and his community and we were called upon right on day two, Dr. Tischoltz and I were asked to give a report about the Rebbe. And you might think, well, that's easy. You just tell what, what, what happened. It's not quite that easy. The Rebbe is a Rebbe. And as you can imagine, being a Rebbe, he has the great responsibility to give people advice, give world leaders advices. And it's not exactly a piece of cake to tell the public that the Rebbe has had such a bad heart attack. Don't bother him with your requests for advice. The Rebbe certainly wouldn't want any part of being reduced in, his, in the eyes of his public who needs his advice and who seeks advice. So we had to be very delicate on not lying to the public, but not revealing all the problems at hand. So I gave it a benign type of report. The Rebbe did have an extensive heart attack. I was very straightforward about it, but I said, we are doing our best to restore as much function as we can. And the time will tell how our efforts are helping him, but I couldn't be that direct. 
And then the Hasidim wanted to test my truth. So it was Yom Tov. It was, it was on the, it was on Simchas Torah, the second day of, the, of this illness. Um, and I was being asked to, to give a nigan, you know, that you did a Farbrengen. Now I had never been to a Farbrengen and I wouldn't say I knew all the nigunim. In fact, I knew none of the nigunim. But as luck would have it, Myra, my wife, was teaching at Wellesley College in Cambridge, and she had some very nice students. One of them invited us once for lunch on a Sunday, and they had public the public broadcasting network on their television, where they had a program called Religions of the World. And just while we were in the room getting ready to join them for lunch, there was a program on Lubavitch, and there was Shkritsky saying Mincha Mincha in his little storefront, bringing, bringing people in for Mincha. And then they had a picture of the Rebbe leading the song Hoshia Esamecha. Little did I know that that was my only Lubavitch song, but it's the only song that came to mind. So I said, Hoshia Esamecha. And everyone was so happy. Little did I realize it was a very appropriate song for Shmini Atzeres Simchas Torah. So I happened to hit it with the crowds by hitting the right song and being prepared to give the perfect nigan for the moment. And that established my veracity in the eyes of the public. It was a very important moment. It sounds like a trivial story, but it is not. Uh, it made it possible for the people to believe that we had you know, honest and earnest reports to give. And I'm very glad we didn't reveal anything at the beginning because the Rebbe would have not been visited by anyone. They would have been mercifully waiting not to bother him. We even allowed the Rebbe to engage himself with the people when it was Shabbos Mavorkin for the next month, because in Shabbos Mavorkin he had promised his father-in-law, Frida Garebe, that he would always host a Farbrengen on the on the Shabbos on, on Shabbos Mavorkin. Since he couldn't give a Shabbos Mavorkin Farbrengen, we allowed him to do it Motzei Shabbos that night, and he gave a radio broadcast that went for about twenty minutes, and it was very. Nice. Nice. Can you elaborate about that radio broadcast that night? Yes, uh, I, I I will I will a little bit. My heart. I wasn't exactly a happy camper that night because I wasn't sure it was the right thing to do, but I said it's probably the easiest thing to compensate for his promise to his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, to give the Shabbos Mavarkin a drasha through this radio broadcast. But we made some rules. As a Rebbe, we have to stay to about 10 minutes. We can't push you too hard. We don't want you to get, to get sick or have irregular heart rhythms from the stress of giving the broadcast. And the Rebbe said quite the opposite, Dr. Weiss, Giving the broadcast will be the best treatment for me. It will alleviate my passion to give this talk just because of the promise made, I made to, the, to my father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, and also because I really want to deliver a message of assurance to the people that I am still with them in my heart and mind and spirit and physically too. I said, Rebbe, limit it to, tw to 10 or 12 minutes and I'll, I'll keep track of the time and I'll be like the guy in the radio studio giving the signal of when to get off the air. And the Rebbe gave me a big nod and a big smile. And then he started talking. And he went to 12 minutes. And I started giving the 12 minute warning sign. I showed him my watch. And the Rebbe kept talking. <laughs> and he gave me a little twinkle, a little smile. And the talk went on and on. I can't tell you how many minutes it was, but it certainly was more than double the, the 12 25 minutes. 25 minutes. 25 minutes. So it was more than double the, the, 10, the 12 minute allowance. And I was sweating bullets because I said, you know, if you push too hard on someone who's just had a heart attack, you can get some serious irregularities of heart rhythm and really cause, you know, a, a real calamity unnecessarily. And so it was done with grace and, and passion on the Rebbe's part and great sweat on my part, but we got through it and we, we gave each other a little wink at the end. The Rebbe was remarkable and how he could look you in the eye and give you that little wink of a reassurance and it was a it was a moment it was a it was a special moment, and I still I still remember it so well in my heart. And we we had many nice nice moments like this. We had times when we had little discussions about science. We had little discussions about you know family matters and um, you know conduct of life and whatnot. And the times with the Rebbe were so precious, even though it was under such adverse circumstances. So this took us through several weeks into the month, uh, into the end of the month of um, well, Tishrei, of course, and the Feshvan, and we got to Kislev, and Rosh Chodesh Kislev came, and Dr. Resnick, I had a team of doctors, a dream team, Dr. as I mentioned, Dr. Tischholz, who did so much good for the Rebbe, 
is the real hero, much more than I was the hero. And it was also Dr. Larry Resnick. Now, Larry Resnick was recruited from his being the head of the Naval Hospital in Honolulu to become the head of a hospital here by, by the State Department negotiating for the change because they recognized the importance of the Rebbe. And Dr. Resnick turns out to have been a boyhood friend of mine who we both went to Shul on Shabbos, the Shem Shul. And our passion was to leave as soon as the Torah was being read as little children, we would just run out so we can swat at each other and play and push and shove and yell and scream outside the shoal. So we were playmates and sometimes even in an adversarial way because I could run faster than Resnick and Resnick could punch harder than I could. And it was usually the usual half care with children outside of the shoal. But it was amazing that we, here we were reuniting in a very positive way, not pushing and shoving and yelling at each other but being cooperative about the medical care of the Rebbe. We also had other very fine people, Dr. Robert Feldman, a member of the community. And we had uh, many people I'm not mentioning, but they were there during the immediate period. And most of all, I wanna give acknowledgement to the wonderful team, the dream team of the secretariat. Rabbi Krinsky was such a giant of a man, such a person who could put us together cooperatively and get things arranged quickly, as was Rabbi Young Klein of Blessed Memory, and Rabbi Label Groner of Blessed Memory. These three members of the Secretariat were overwhelmingly kind. And I also had the privilege of staying at the Krinsky household for hospitality on my many trips that followed on these missions, even in, in, not the immediate stay where I was living at 770, literally with the Rebbe in the room, but on subsequent visits. So I have to give a, a major a word of appreciation of Horace Cove to the secretariat, my fellow doctors, and even my own teacher, my own professor, Bernard Laun, was brought in from China by the State Department where he was on a research mission in cardiology because they, the State Department recognized the importance of the Rebbe to the State Department. Now, I can't tell you what, what the importance was, but obviously the Rebbe had his finger on so many things around the world that maybe the State Department had to have a lot of immediate contact with him and wanted, wanted the Rebbe to be surviving this in full power so they, they could be continued to be helped by his, his wise advice in regard to matters of state, in regard to the State Department's activities. But, all, but altogether, it was a remarkable experience. I also got to know Lerbitz and Schneerson even better than the time I made Kiddush on Shmini Yatseris because I found it necessary to get a report on the Lerbitz medical status by calling the Lerbitz in, in the evening, usually around 10 o'clock our time, 11 o'clock New York time. She kept late hours always as did the Rebbe. And so I always got the latest story. And of course the Rebbe being such a kind lady, she took me in almost like a son. So she learned that I love the Chicago Cubs. So she would always know- That's why you called her every day, right? Every, you know, it was six days a week, except in Arab Shabbos, but uh, six days a week regularly. And believe me, phone bills weren't cheap in those days. We didn't have all these services. <laughs> now it's almost free to make a phone call around the world. But in those days, it was a little bit the opposite, but it, it worked out fine. It was the best way to keep in track, keep track of the Rebbe. And um, it was just such a remarkable experience to know her. My wife and I visited her on a couple of occasions. She was the most gracious host. As I said, always dressed in such a dignified, quiet style that was so remarkable, a later remarkable style and grace and also wisdom and knowledge. As you might have heard in some of the stories about her life, she trained in architecture. When the Rebbe studied mechanical engineering in Sorbonne, she also studied, but she studied in, um, architectural engineering. And in her house, you could see what she was reading. She was reading books on science, books on biology. She would make almost a weekly trip on her own, driving herself into Manhattan to the Bryant Park area of New York City, where the New York Public Library was. And she would indulge in reading books that appealed to her interest in the science. I used Advice, to- Can I ask a question about the Rebison? Yes. You see all the years, starting from the previous Rebbe took her when he went to exile in Kastrama, in, 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 in Tashin Yudalif, uh, 5711, she was the catalyst of the Rebbe taking the leadership. Um, this time she was the catalyst of, um, of basically the whole, the whole decision she supported the Rebbe 100%. By the Sfarim, the books, the Rebbe said that she was the one who her statement saying the Rebbe belongs to Chassidim, not only the books, 
became the the win the piece of the winning statement. So you see, a, a, in major decisions in Lubavitch, the major thing for the Rebbe's life, she was she was the the moving force behind it. Can you talk a minute about her dedication of her iskashris and her devotion to the Rebbe uh, as uh, as a, a, a dedication to the Rebbe. Now I'll tell you the the most about that was revealed on Rosh Chodesh Kislev, and this is a a, a very heartwarming aspect of Rosh Chodesh Kislev. You know, we were all so thrilled that we reached the conclusion Dr. Resnick at that time was on duty in New York for the Rebbe on that, on that day. And he released the Rebbe from our coronary care unit and helped him walk part of the way home to escape our, our, our doctor's clutches so he could be home for a little privacy. And he told Dr. Resnick and also later confirmed this with me that the biggest victory in Rosh Chodesh Kislev was more than the Hasidim saw. To him, the biggest victory was the privilege of being able to return home to the privacy moments he had with his wife when he had tea in the late afternoon on a regular basis. Now, he had the tea with Rebbitson at the study every day during the period of recovery from the heart attack, but it was much better to be in privacy where they could share thoughts on a little more of a relaxed basis. And he said to me, and he said that Dr. Weiss, the privilege of being able to be with my wife for tea in the afternoon is on par with the privilege of being able to put on tefillin in the morning. In other words, that's how important that moment of quietude and being with his wife. And I told I tell the story repeatedly because I want all the young Hasidim who are getting married and those who are already married and those who are you know long married, that one has to take not take for granted the privilege of being with your wife and being having that private moment when you're not being hit by phone calls or whatever distractions might come up and you have time really to share thoughts and even, as you say, have someone who can really help help you, help guide you in life as she did with the Rebbe and as you mentioned. And I'll also refer to the testimony that she gave. I, I encourage everyone to read the testimony that Rebbe Hertz referred to. It was a remarkable matter how she supported the Rebbe and how she defended him. She was the one who had to give the deposition because it was my medical opinion that the deposition would be very damaging to, to somebody that happened to the Rebbe on Yutes Kislev. When the Rebbe gave his first Barbrengan, public Barbrengan, Yutes Kislev, the crowd was so thrilled to see the Rebbe, and it was a full scale Barbrengan. But little did the crowd know that during the time he was giving his talks, he was being privately monitored with our secret little monitors. And we had these under our long benches at 770 looking at some very wild irregularities in heart rhythm that almost prompted. Dr. Resnick and I to leap out of our seats to stop the Rebbe on the spot in front of the public. We had a hey, just- Can you tell us a little more about Fabrengen, the Maima that time? The Rebbe's the Maima and the Sikha okay. that Fabrengen? So, so the, the, the Fabrengen comp composed of Sikhos and Ma the Maima. And during three or four of the, I think three of the Sikhos, which was the start of Fabrengen, the, the Sikhos were the beginning, we watched on the monitor, and this was a telemonitor. I might want to just go back one bit on this before I get into the story, that one of the features of the Rebbe's care was something that couldn't be provided in a normal hospital. We were able to give the Rebbe telemonitoring, which you take for granted. You put a telemonitor on and the radio signal broadcasts the signal. You don't have to be all wired up and bound in bed. But back in 1977, a heart patient was locked in bed by big wires that were hooked to your heart and hardwired to the to a console that monitored your heart rhythm in case it would become abnormal, you would see that right away, but you couldn't easily get out of bed, certainly not go to the bathroom with anything but a lot of people moving you and all these wires. We had the Rebbe connected to what was used in the space program. We had we had Dr. Tischholz as one of the advisors of the national, the NASA, the, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and he had helped develop telemonitoring for the space, the people out in outer space. We were able to go somewhere on the New Jersey Turnpike to their installation to get these monitors on day one and have the Rebbe wired up so he would be free to move around like a Rebbe and look like a Rebbe, not like a patient wired up in prison with these wires. So we had the Rebbe always wired and the mon monitor at, at Yudtes Yud Kislev, he was wired that way and no one knew it because the wires don't show, they're under the kapata and we have our monitors under their bench. And when you're in a Farbregen, as all those who've been at Farbregen, you're packed like sardines. 
and these nice wide brimmed hats and you're looking over your bench. No one knows you're looking at a monitor and no one even sitting next to us knew that we had such equipment right at our knees while everyone was just bunched together under the benches like this. We were busy looking at the monitors in absolutely panic because we saw such bad arrhythmias that we had never seen before until we got to the Sichas. And we were just, we knew we were doing something morally incorrect by not running up there to stop the Rebbe. Yet on the other hand, had we done that, we would have caused mass panic and perhaps derail the Rebbe's effectiveness for the years to come because people would see how fragile he was at that moment. We had made the mistake of putting him out at a Farbrengen and that was, you know, we didn't anticipate such arrhythmias because we had not seen them for the previous six weeks, but there we were with something horrible. And, and so the Sikhos were each accompanied by wild irregularities in heart rhythm that scared us very, very much. We just let it go on. We just said we can't interrupt the Rebbe and make him, make him a spectacle in front of the public like this. And panic would, would ensue in the whole crowd and the Rebbe's whole effective career might be derailed. So we took the risk of his having something that might even require resuscitation if the rhythm had become off rail enough. So when he got to his mimer, the mimer with the different tone of the mimer and the different the melody sung before the mimer, it made the rhythm absolutely perfect. It was like miraculously night and day, Sicha versus mimer, Sicha with a terrible rhythm Mimer with an absolutely normal rhythm that we, like we had been seeing for the previous six weeks. And from that, I learned that you have to be very careful, even with a Rebbe who wants to do a lot of good. And uh, there was some wisdom in my confining his radio program to 12 minutes because that's the kind of thing we wanted to avoid. So I presented to just Sif Sifton or Silton, I can't remember, I think it's Sifton. I presented the argument that the Rebbe had such a track record of having very Life threat, severely life threatening arrhythmias when he was under severe pressure and stress. I said, There's no need to put him through a deposition which could bring out such things and lead to a fatality, God forbid, and totally unnecessarily. So that's why the Rebbitson stepped in and really did the job right. So the Rebbitson really took over for the Rebbe in, in a matter that could have stirred up some real hornet's nests with regard to the potential for arrhythmia. And naturally, the Rebbe was confronted with all kinds of world crises during the subsequent 15 years, some of which could have triggered arrhythmias, but things got better and better. His heart became more stabilized and the Rebbe, Rebbe became used to some of the limitations he recognized internally. And the fact that he and the Rebbitson seriously avoided excessive sodium in their diet by switching from foods that don't require koshering, from foods that require koshering to foods that don't require koshering, he markedly reduced his intake of sodium, even though he admitted to me that he loved salty foods. This was his passion to have foods that were well salted. He was very, very, very disciplined and got right on the stick as did the Rebbitson to make the diet protective of his heart size by shrinking it down because sodium is such a great blotter that causes retention of fluid. That would have made the heart walls work much harder because of all the tension of the wall, like overinflating a car tire. Too much air in the tire, the rubber is stretched and it's a matter of give and take between the rubber and, and, the, and the breaking point or the inability to contract properly. You once spoke about in, in Chicago that the Rebbe actually spoke to you how to heal his own heart and a whole theory which um, about stem cell and how to heal the, heal the heart. Yes, we touched upon that a little bit earlier in this talk, Rebbe Hertz. I hope my video, my audio was coming through. Yeah, it I was. Yeah. But I mentioned that even in the early days of the heart attack, day one and two, he talked to Dr. Tischels and me in a remarkable, remarkably creative way. We had, you know, we're, we work in the field work where this is our field and we didn't even come upon such thinking. And here he was presenting this to us as a thinking person who has studied engineering and science and physics, but we were roughly, the other thing I might say in talking about talking to doctors, or it may go back to one point, we had five doctors. It's like having five cooks in the kitchen. And often what happens is mayhem because this one has this idea of how to cook the stew. And this one has this idea of what spices to put in. And this one says, this is how you cook it. And we always, as doctors, had different opinions. The Rebbe would listen courteously to all of us at a little conference circle around, his, around him in his room. And he would come up with a solution that would incorporate all five opinions and not to in any way disgrace or embarrass or belittle any one of the doctors whose opinion might not have held as much water as some of the other opinions. And I found this such a skill that the Rebbe had because he had 
he had his his ability to understand us and even understand the need to make everyone feel honored. It, he had such an amazing connection with people. I, I don't think I could tell anyone here in the crowd who's met the Rebbe that this is true, but this was a very difficult thing because it was a matter of his health being on the line and he still was able to incorporate everyone's idea in some meaningful way so that it wouldn't cause uh, you know, some disruption in the, in the feeling we had towards him as part of the doctor serving him. I'd like to ask you a question. You know that oh, in the years of the Mems, I know I remember as a Bacher, there was a question, do you go to the Rebbe, Koisha Bracha, do you not go? There was different opinions. Some said you're bothering the Rebbe, the Rebbe said he wants everyone to come up. Um, in, in your involvement with the Rebbe, the idea of the Rebbe going to the Rebbe and, and all these times, Koisha Bracha, Lekach, Dalas, etc. what did, did it add to the Rebbe? Or was it a burden the Rebbe? Do you collaborate on that a little bit? I think that I think the Bachram who came to do this were doing the right thing. To, to the Rebbe, it was nourishment of the soul and spirit and strength. Now, it is true that the Rebbe was not, does not have infinite strength, nor does anyone else. And so there were times when the Farbregen would go till two in the morning, and I'd come back to do the examination after the Farbregen. I'd say, Rebbe, I think we, we, went, we stayed up too late. We should, have, we should have been told by our mothers to go to sleep a little earlier. Um, but I think the Rebbe held up to this, and he was actually nourished in every way, physically and spiritually, by people coming for the dollar, for the kosher bracha, for the extra, the extra nigan that would be sung late at night, especially after Shemini Atzeres Simchas Torah. Um, and he, he thrived, it made him thrive in, in, in the net. You know, it, I think there were some exhaustion points here and there, which I won't reveal, <laughs> but, but truly he did, he was nourished by this. So it altogether was uh, remarkable to me, the 15 years of strength that he showed after recovery from the heart attack uh, brought out something that I think we can't overlook. And I'm sure many people in the audience here assembled with us in London realized that one of the biggest impacts of the Rebbe now, you know, these 43 years later is the impact he left around the world of having the program of the Shluchim the shluchim are everywhere in the world, figuratively speaking, and it's the work of the Rebbe, especially in that period of time when the program really expanded greatly. And I think the Rebbe, having the strength to do this and having the time to do this, put this on the map, both figuratively and literally. And Dr. Weiss, you mentioned uh, there's a story which I've heard from you in the past about the Rebbetzin when you came for a Shabbos uh, that time where you were supposed to miss, miss a class reunion, are you able to share it? Maybe I, know I, am, I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to put anyone to sleep with a long. Everyone, story. everyone wants to hear you. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. I'm sure, you everybody promise, here wants to hear you. I promise I won't be offended if you fall asleep on a long story. But it, it goes like this. So nice the, Rebbe, the Rebbe always took a very strong personal interest in my own life. He was, he was interested in the fact that I went to a secular public school in Chicago, a co-educational school. And he often asked, you know, how was your standing of the class and how was it to be in such a class? And I said it was a large school and I got to be friends with many of the people in the class and, and there was a very good relationship with my class. And I always looked forward to my class reunions every 10 years. So in 1981 was my 20th class reunion from the 1961 graduation. And I told the Rebbe that I'm getting ready for the reunion. And he said, he's very happy. He said, you should not miss it. You might have to tell some people some stories about your connections here in Chabad. And I think in the back of his mind, he was thinking maybe some of the Jewish, the many Jewish students in my school might be influenced positively by hearing about the Rebbe because they, it was a secular school without that kind of background. Uh, my background was the secular school plus the enrichment, the great enrichment of my little cater, a go to Chabad when I was a child in the Edgewater neighborhood of Chicago. And I said that um, it's going to be held right after uh, Shabbos, Motzei Shabbos, and Sunday. So I, the Rebbe was very happy about it, and I assured him I was not going to miss the reunion. But as we got to Friday, I got a report from Benjamin Klein that the Rebbetson was not feeling well. In fact, she had a fever. There were certain spots on her skin that didn't look too promising, and she wasn't as attentive to reading the paper because her reading was really some, a remarkable feature. You go there and see how well read she was in the type of journals and books that she's reading from around the world 
folks from uh, journals from France and from Germany and all this. And I said, oh my gosh, he's, it's a radical change. So it goes back to at the time when the Rebbe had the heart attack, the Rebbe asked me a favor. He said, Dr. Weiss, you've spent so much attention on my case. Would you give the Rebbe even just a little listen to her heart? She doesn't have any heart problems, but could you just take note of her heart sounds? And I said, I'll be happy to, Rebbe. And the Rebbe agreed to that. And at the time in 1977, when the Rebbe was being helped through his recovery, I noticed a very faint little murmur up under one of her, by one of her heart valves. And I told the Rebbe and the Rebbe that this murmur was soft. It doesn't represent anything that's hemodynamically too significant or not, not dangerous. But I said, you, well, I'll listen to it periodically, maybe a couple of times a year, I'll take a notice of how it sounds. And with that in the back of my mind, I said, here the Rebbe is having this fever and these spots on her skin and the loss of the ability to concentrate the way she normally would. I said, maybe she has acquired an infection on this heart valve that is called endocarditis. This is not a commonly unheard term, but it's a, it's a very serious term. And I've had occasion to treat endocarditis, recognizing how serious it is and how devastating are the effects if you don't treat it promptly and properly. And I said, she had this murmur and it might be that the valve got infected from something like a dental infection or things that commonly seed the valve with bacteria. So I told, I told Vinyam Klein, I said, I think it's imperative that the Rebbe be, be examined right today on Friday and I'll come right in. I'll take the plane. It might involve coming in on the edge or beginning of Shabbos, but I think it's mandatory medically. And can you tell the Rebbe about my intention? So Rabbi Klein, of course, does this and calls me back. He said, the Rebbe is very concerned that you'll be missing your reunion and that involves travel on Shabbos. The Rebbe invites you to come to see the Rebbe on Sunday morning, on Sunday when your reunion is over and all the things will be the same. And I told Ben Yom Klein, please tell the Rebbe that they may not be the same. This disease might move forward fast enough that I, and I didn't, I didn't get a yes or a no but I just left it at that. And I made my own decision. I said, I know a normal chassid would listen to the Rebbe. You always listen to the Rebbe, but I'm not the full chassid like the rest of the people who listen to the Rebbe more carefully. And I said, I really have to make my own decision to come in even against the Rebbe's advice and miss the reunion. That's meaningless. I can, I can see it the next 10 years will be a 30 year reunion. I'll catch up then. But the important thing is to get to the Rebbe and right away and make a diagnosis. So I did get in and it was, Early in the evening, early, early in Shabbos uh, already, by the time I got to the airport, the people on the public transportation system were very nice. Everyone let me on without any, those days they used tokens and, and you didn't have to use cash and all this. They let me take it like a Shabbos, a, a horizontal Shabbos elevator. I took the subway train right in and got in with feeling that I did the best I could. When I came to the door of, seventh, of, of uh, 13 or, 13 or 4 President Street where the Reb and Rebison lived, I knocked on the door feeling that they might have gone to sleep already and they won't hear the knock, but I gave a nice loud knock and like lightning, the door opening as if someone's standing by the door waiting to open it. And it's Tessin Halberstam, the, the master of the house who took care of the Rebbe and Rebbe's needs in the house. He was standing by the door awaiting my visit on the instruction of the Rebbe. I opened the door and there's the Rebbe in his full Shabbos garb beautifully dressed, sitting in his parlor and telling me that he's very appreciative of my coming. And he told me the Rebbitson is upstairs. And I examined the Rebbitson and confirmed the things that I was worried about. The possibility of heart valve infection seemed to be more likely on physically examining the heart with my stethoscope and looking at the things on the skin and talking to the Rebbitson. And I got to work on getting that treatment underway. And then the Rebbe called me down to have a discussion about what was wrong with his wife. And he presents me for a little Sidurim. It was a translation of the Hilas Hashem Siddur that I grew up with from the time I was six years old in Peter. It was a beautiful translation by Yitzchak Mangel, who the Rebbe commissioned to do the most beautiful translation because of the richness of the English language and the great vocabulary language. There's a lot of connotations in different words. Mangel, who was, who was a scholar of English, was able to do the translation just right. It was the best translation I'd ever seen. My, my Hebrew wasn't strong enough to support my full understanding of the prayers. And here was what I, what I really needed. 
and it came out in synchrony, almost in synchrony with the, the larger scale version, which came out before this little version. Harry bought a, a, a version for my wife, myself, and at that time I just had two daughters then, Sarah and, Rafa, uh, Sarah and uh, Rebecca, and so I had two copies, one for each of those. So four little books were sitting there. The Rebbe was prepared for my visit, even with a matana, even with a gift. And I was so heartwarmed by his thinking of me. And then came the issue of the reunion. The Rebbe asked me, Dr. Weiss, I'm very appreciative of your helping the Rebbeson and getting things on the right track. But what about your reunion? I said, well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, return, I'll certainly make every plan with God's help to be a on, on hand for the 30th reunion, God willing. And the Reverend said, what about the 20th reunion, which you missed? And he said, well, you know, everyone does send in a sheet of paper about what they've been up to. Are they married, not married? They have children, not children, what their professions are. And I said, you know, about half the, half the 500 in the class send in this sheet. So it's about 250 or maybe 300 pages come in and it's assembled in a book. And the Reverendson asked me as a personal favor, he said, Dr. Weiss, did you know all those 250 or 300 kids in your class? And I said, actually, I knew about half of them quite well. And the other half, I didn't know quite as well. He said, would you do me a, fa a personal favor to read all the pages, even the ones you didn't know very well, just read every page to know, to be up to date with your class, at least in this minimalist way. And I told the Rebbe for sure I would follow his request. And as the book came out a month or so after the reunion, I come upon a page, a girl named Doreen is in the book, I didn't know Doreen very well. I knew she was a very upright, nice member of the class. I just didn't have that much contact with her. And she's talking about her husband who had had a kidney transplant. And mind you, back in 1977, kidney transplants were not a well-worked out technology. A lot of failures, a lot of heartbreaks, a lot of disappointments on the, on the promise of the procedure. But here, her husband was being greatly helped by it at the pioneering institution, which is University of Minnesota. As it happens down the street from where we live, we live on a short little street. And on the end of the street is a doctor and his wife with whom we are friends. And the wife was suffering from kidney failure. And she was an age mate of ours. And we were heartbroken at how she was doing. And the two of them had decided to go for transplant, but there was some hesitation and some uncertainties. And I decided to link them up with Doreen and her husband who was in the reunion book. And they got together, it was like natural, Friends made in heaven. They, the, four, the four of them were a great two couples together and they encouraged each other on the matter of the transplant. And our dear neighbor down the street, Baruch Hashem, now 43 years later, oh, actually now it's now about 40, 40 or so years later since the story, is still Baruch Hashem thriving with her kidney transplant, the same transplant. And she's such a wonderful person. It's a remarkable story. And it comes in part for the Rebbe's encouragement for me to read it this book about the reunion. And so even though they would have had the transplant anyway, I think the couple that they met from my high school gave an added encouragement and words of advice that were very meaningful to make this a long-term result. I'm sure that they had some role in her long-term survival. And the neighbors down the street are very wise and intelligent and the husband is a doctor, which helps too. But it's a very nice story. Rabbi, you're, you're muted right now. Okay. I, uh, um, of Pesach time, there was someone in the community who had, um, who had COVID very seriously and miraculously was seven weeks in a ventilator and in Chicago and survived. Perfect. And he had some heart damage. And uh, I, someone in our community, I told them to speak to you. And you told him the Rebbe's... Uh, what we did for the Rebbe, and that worked, the person had a miraculous recovery. So I think it's, it's interesting that that, that, totally, uh, that totally transformed. The, 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 you, you gave him the exact regimen what happened with the Rebbe. Um, have you been telling people, saying this is a, so, some of the techniques you've been, you know, which was interesting, the person came back to... Uh, well, I don't think I was as instrumental as you claim I am, I, I want to tone it down a little bit. I was very happy to talk and help the person in the best way I could, but I mentioned to him the contact I had with the Rebbe about the Rebbe's experience with the pandemic. Now the Rebbe who was just turning 16 in the year 1918 in Europe, and at that time, 
the whole world was hit with an influenza A type virus. It's a different, it's different from the coronavirus, um, but it's, it is a viral pandemic and it had a very great severe decimating effect on worldwide population. I mean, its, it's impact was tremendous. And the Rebbe and I got to talk about it when the Rebbe was asking me how I acquired the name Yitzhak, which is my first name, Yitzhak Zev. And I told the Rebbe I'm named after a very humble and pious grandfather who died in the epidemic of 1918, the year, died in the year 1918 of uh, the influenza A. He was a tailor. He probably acquired the germs the, the virus from the work that he did on the clothing of people who brought in. In those days, there weren't washing machines as handily available. Clothing was not as well cleaned, and he might have acquired it from one of his customers inadvertently, which, you know, the sad, the sad effect was. But I told the Rebbe about it, and the Rebbe shared with me his experience. He was at that time a 16-year-old, just turning 16. And in those days, radio had been invented by the inventor Marconi in Italy, but there wasn't broadcast radio for any country, except if you were maybe a general in an army, you had a certain special ability to have a private radio system to conduct World War I. But there wasn't a radio broadcast, and there certainly wasn't a daily newspaper dropped on your doorstep every morning by the, by the delivery boy coming down with the morning paper. You had to figure a lot of things out for yourself without the availability of a moment by moment, day by day news. And the Rebbe is a young, bright, student recognized that this was a spreadable disease like many other plagues that had hit Europe in other eras. In the history books, you can read about these plagues. Most of them were bacterial. Some of, some of them may have been viral. But the Rebbe thought of himself, like his family and others, as being in a burning forest where the proximity to neighboring trees could conduct the problem. One tree spreading the fire to the next and to the next, and you have a massive destruction of the forest. The Rebbe figured that the best thing about being human in this case would be that you have feet and can walk away and walk out of the forest and isolate yourself. So he brought himself and convinced his parents to stay at home in isolation from this raging plague, which wasn't known at that time to even be a virus at the, at the time it started. And he he stepped out of the yeshiva and trained under his father, was a very learned father who, who was, became his teacher. And it was an effective strategy. It happens as time went on, he was recognizing how many people were sick and how many people needed help that he decided on his own to go out to help them only to become very sick himself. He didn't, of course, was one of the fatalities, but he became very sick. He had such a high fever that he was in a febrile delirium for a while. And then he had to reconcile the idea of how far do you go to help people and on the other hand, protect yourself. It's quite a balance. He once at that time when telling me the story, asking the question, Dr. Weiss, at that time in the early eighties, AIDS, the AIDS virus was plaguing our country. And he said, Dr. Weiss, if you were presented a sick heart patient who happens to have AIDS, would you refrain from treating? Because the doctors had the option of not stepping on these cases. And I said, if I take the proper protective measures and if the hospital is taking the proper steps, I would certainly be willing to treat a patient with AIDS who needed heart help with my level of training because I would apply my help provided I'm protective. And the Rebbe liked the answer very much. He said, he said that he coincides with the way of thinking that if you're gonna go out that far, you have to be sure you're protecting yourself. I would take from it in today's modern world, the lesson that you have to be careful about protecting yourself to be isolated from the, the plague hitting the world now and also being willing to help people if you have the training and are being protected properly. But I think the ideas that the public is not following is to be protecting one another and I'm really a very big adherent. Of course, I haven't had my dear Rebbe to talk about with about this, but I can reason out from the Rebbe's examples, not, notable examples, noble examples and proper examples, that it would be proper to use all the precautions being recommended by the wise health authorities who, who run the country or run the governments. I'm not talking about people with political issues, I'm talking about people who have medical knowledge and apply it. And so I, I do, make the habit of going out of my house with a mask on, even if I'm not among public, just as almost an advertisement that it's a necessary step so we don't spread it to other people. We may not be protecting ourselves as much as protecting others from getting it from us. And that's a very, that's the right, that's the right way to look at mask, use of mask. And it's, it doesn't sound as self-protective as you want it to be, but part of being self-protective is also to be protective of other people. It's like the uh, in the way of 
keeping it from spreading to others, you also, in a sense, reduce the, the pandemic and help yourself indirectly in that way. Otherwise, you gave up. You gave up your uh, when it happened. Some Chastaira, you gave up everything. I, I know from Chicago, your your business, your family, everything you left. Basically, um, you've told me many times, and I suppose it's just it, you basically went for the Rebbe like all the way, like in a mysterious nefesh way. How you know? I'm saying how long you were you were there for? Close to two months initially, correct? Well, I was actually actually on the premises for the first two weeks, you know, and then I came back home. And then uh, I was quite quickly relieved of my, my job that I had been recruited for from Boston to Chicago. So I, and I'm not much of a business person, you know, knows how to organize a practice in an office. I was a little bit short on the end of the Parnassa stick, um, but I did have a, a very loyal following. Certainly people who knew about the Rebbe wanted to see me. <laughs> and not being much of a businessman, I set up a practice that had the philosophy of not billing anybody. I just said, if you have insurance, I'll do my best to fill out the forms and let them work out the most logical solution. So I didn't have a billing department. Uh, we didn't send people notices that you owe me $5 for the last visit on the copay, or you owe me $25 for the whole visit. But in the, so the Parnassa was a little short, but I'll tell you, I never suffered financially from that at all. Um, not because I'm a great strategist, but I just was a person who lives a kind of a lightweight life lifestyle. We don't go through big expenditures. And Chassid, I, a believer. <laughs> and, I, and I also derived such benefit from being with the Rebbe that I said, the rewards over, overwhelm any losses, you know, that, 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 you know, and I also had, had the ability to run a practice without billing patients and no, no medical group in, in America can run like that. We, we don't have nationalized healthcare. So if you're a doctor who wants to keep paying the rent in your office, you better fill your patients and do all the things that are necessary. If you want to take your family on little vacations here and there, you better do that too. But I found it was not necessary. And I was very happy. I couldn't have joined a group of doctors because no one would take me in with that philosophy. That just doesn't sail in America. Our health system is, is a lot different from the British health system, which I, I would commend the Brits for having thought of it. <laughs> I wish we would think of it too. But I was happy to do it. And I also had more power over how I would indulge my time, who I would see and how I, I wasn't under anyone's rule. I, did, I worked at the hospital and in a sense for the hospital, but I wasn't under their command. And I'll tell you, being independent as a doctor is much better than being under the command. The more I see of medicine in my old age, is that I see that it's so highly regulated that a doctor really doesn't get a chance to indulge as much time as necessary for certain cases. There are some cases when the patient has to be seen on a much longer time scale than a half hour or an hour that's delegated in some healthcare strategy or some system that runs your practice for you. So I had all this independence and it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful to have that independence. And this came as a direct consequence and gift of uh, attaching to the Rebbe and forfeiting my job. It was quite a big um, change though. And it certainly upset all the people around me. It was hard on my family. My time spent was always... We, we call that Mesir Snefesh. Uh, well, I think you're more of an example, Rabbi Hertz. I, I wish the people here knew you better, but you are the example of Mesir Snefesh that I would look up to. Dr. Weiss, I want to say one more thing here. Um, I, I remember, um, one of the things we saw the Rebbe was, the Rebbe always encouraged Simcha. Simcha's Taira, the Rebbe said he should dance, and it helps his health. Hashkaydish Kisa, the Rebbe acknowledged it. And I've seen by you also that every you come to a Simcha, you always, the few minutes you're there, you're always dancing you're, in the times before the COVID times, but you always had that simcha, that energy of dancing, walking in. Talk a little bit about, I think the important piece of the day today, Rosh Chodesh Kislev, which was the Rebbe, the simcha of Hasidim was unreal. The Rebbe was, you know, impressed by the simcha, she said, Mala, that, you know, it was very special. Talk about the simcha, the Rebbe, the Rebbe infused in us a little bit, that, that, that joy of the Rebbe. Um, I can tell you, come in for, Shmi Yatzeres Simchas Torah started out the, the night of Shmi Yatzeres and going to the various sukkahs around. I went to Binyam Klein's sukkah with Leah Klein and had a wonderful time dancing there. Then there was the Raskin sukkah, the people who had the fish market on, 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 uh, on uh, Kingston Road, Kingston Street. Um, the, the night was spent in total joy. I don't care how dead you might feel it brought you up to life immediately. And to see the Rebbe's spirit and be so thankful that the Rebbe 
could maintain that spirit. I can tell you a cute little story about that spirit. So sadly enough, in 1976, as you might remember, that Benjamin Netanyahu lost his brother, the Entebbe raid. It was a very tragic outcome. The Rebbe invited Netanyahu as a young man to come and have a little fun. I think it was, it could have been Simchas Torah or something equivalent to Simchas Torah, where there was a, I think it was Simchas Torah. So he had heard that Netanyahu bragged that he was an athlete, and I, the Rebbe knew that I was a track person who had won certain awards in track and, you know, track and field. So he wanted to see who, who bragged best. So he put me in a circle with Netanyahu and with Netanyahu's entourage and some other people from Chabad who knew how to dance. And we did a dance, I think, when it went pretty close to 45, 50 minutes. And to me, it was a piece of cake. And the Israelis who were supposed to be so athletic, they they were they were they were they were not well rehearsed for that for that for that moment. I would have to say that they needed a little work on their ability to to keep pace with us Chabadniks who really knew how to dance and knew what it was like to go 45, 50 minutes nonstop. When I went to Kassanism, it was the same thing, uh, Rabbi Hartz, that really just the spirit of a, of a happy Hasana and with people you knew and loved and were very happy for. You you didn't get sucked in, you suck them in with your joy about the situation. It's it's almost an automatic pilot. It comes from borrowed energy that you don't even know you have. As wise, you should know, um, Sunday night you spoke for Rabbi Moskowitz, uh, the Fabrengen. Well, the Fabrengen is still continuing. There's an ongoing Fabrengen going around the world of the Kinez HaShlochem into Rosh Chodesh is continuing. Um, I happened to be on a few hours ago, Rabbi Shlema Kunin got on and he spoke about you. He stood next to you, he had a place here next to Fabrengen. He was very he mentioned close. something about making Kiddush or Mashka with you in the Sukkah. <laughs> he said something <laughs> that you actually, every year, we had a, we had a very big, we had a very big Chazaka. Uh, we got into this Chazaka right away. We didn't even wait for the usual. I think it takes three three repeats to take it a Chazaka. It was a Chazaka from moment one, where we would drink a little beyond our capacity. I won't recommend this for everyone. And for the week of heart, I would not recommend it at all. But we would have a big Becher filled up. And it was stuff that was a little strong for me. But we were in a state of mind from that that was Unmistakable. And so I would, I would tell you that Rabbi Kuhn and I had a very, very good Kazaka there. And that was uh, starting the, the night of Ashmi Yatzeris. Anything the Rebbe commented on that afterwards? You said Lachaim, anything with the Rebbe on that afterwards? Um, I mean, we caught the Rebbe's eye and we and we were we were noticed, the Rebbe noticed us, but I don't I can't expand on that, maybe because I was already a little bit beyond my capacity. <laughs> Or didn't know how to hold my liquor or something like that. <laughs> maybe maybe those who are not as much uh, involved at the uh, effect of the alcohol could have done better in re relating this to you. <laughs> I don't recommend heavy drinking, but I would say there was a spirit in the air that just carried you into um, the ability to do a little more than usual. I, I'm not recommending, especially for young people to take this on. Rabbi Hertz? Yes. Rabbi Hurt, I suspect that um, Dr. Wise is, is covering up on something. Could you please reveal what happened at that moment of intoxication? <laughs> I think, I, I won't say that mum's the word, but I can't, I can't speak further. <laughs> if you can get him. Um, yeah. I, I was also going to say, um, no, I was saying you you also once spoke about that when you came every time you came to the Rebbe, there were people who the Rebbe asked you about right away, like even before himself. It, it was which was I, I remember once at, a, at an event we had some uh, we did an event of non Chabad people sitting there, and they were very amazed that the first second when you came to visit the Rebbe, the first thing they ever wanted to know about this person, that person, and different questions are people who you treated or the Rebbe knew about. Can you maybe share a little bit of that? Yes, I can't mention names, of course, but no names. Had, no, I, I, I know. Yeah, I know. We, we had in Chicago a young lady who had had a serious stroke. She was living at the time in Philadelphia, and it was it looked like a nightmare because here's a young lady. She's, I think, she's a new family just beginning. She wasn't married that long when this happened, and I heard the story on the telephone. And of course, I, it was Friday afternoon, I got the calls. And Friday afternoon is always bedlam for any person who's observant, especially your doctor, trying to get things done properly so you can get to Shabbos. 
and not leave anyone behind. So I was hearing these stories from the phone call or the phone connections weren't so good in those days. And I put two and two together, kind of like the Rebbitson story that when I heard this story and this story, I said, this lady has a heart valve infection like the Rebbitson, like the Rebbitson had. And this was a few years before the Rebbitson got sick. This was around 1979 or so. And I gave advice on the phone, which is always hazardous when you're a doctor not seeing the patient, not you know examining. But I said, please go to this and this group of specialists who can really listen to the heart and do an echocardiogram properly and look at the whole clinical pattern. And I think the young lady has a heart valve infection that has thrown something into her brain causing the stroke. It's not common for a young person to have a stroke, especially since she has normal blood pressure, doesn't have a background of this, doesn't have a family history. And the family was very attentive to my hastily assembled comments and, was, and they got to work on this right away. And this was confirmed that she had the echocardiogram test done in Philadelphia. And it showed that there was a growth on one of the heart valves from bacterial growth on the valve, from a, probably from a dental infection. And it had thrown a big clot up into the brain. And as often is the case, when you're a young person who has normal arteries, a clot can dissolve. So her clot did dissolve and was treated for, with the proper bacteriologic, you know, antibiotics, antibiotics that killed the bacteria. So she recovered, all that we can measure was a complete recover neurologically, and then this treatment. But there was still a residual thing seen on the valve that never went away even after all the treatment. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe always remembered this. As tough as things were, even when his wife passed away, he was asking me about this patient in Chicago with whom he attached. So when the, when the young lady's son became of bar mitzvah age, I went to the bar mitzvah, I had only one gift in mind, to give the young son one of the dollars the Rebbe had given me because of his involvement with the family and his immense impact on the spirit that she had hearing that the Rebbe was interested in her and her complete recovery. It was a remarkable follow. -up. This was just one of many examples that I just mentioned because it's a Chicago-based story of people with whom you've come in contact with. And I would tell you, this is typical of the Rebbe to have followed through. My father himself had had heart surgery two and a half years after I took care of the Rebbe and had a very adverse outcome with a massive loss of his whole circulation on the left side of his brain. So he was no longer able to move at all on the right side or talk or read or speak or see out of the right side of his vision field. And my mother, who was half his size, she was a five footer, he was above a six footer, uh, had to take care of him by herself on the third floor of a walk apartment. And the Rebbe took such interest. He even asked how I was taking care of my mother and father. I said, my visits just are helping them mechanically. My mother is very competent. And he, he asked me, do I do anything for my father that gives them any pleasure or fun? I said, when you're this crippled, there's not much you can really do for someone. He said, the Rebbe's taught me to rethink this. He said, well, what does your father like to do? I said, I'm embarrassed to tell you, Rebbe. My father was kind of a rough and ready guy who liked to play cards with his friends in the billiards room, in the pool room. And that's, that was his enjoyment when he had a free moment. He said, well, why don't you take him back there? I said, Rebbe, do you know what a, what a pool room or a billiards room is? He said, of course I do. I knew about them in Berlin. And so he was a worldly enough man to know that it was a place of some degree of uh, disrespect, disrepute. But he said, for your father, this would be such a joy to see his old friends and hear old stories and even smell the cigar smoke and the blue smoke that fills the room. And the Rebbe was so correct that it was a very, our Sundays were spent. I would fill, finish up charts in my, of my patients in the pool room while my father was sitting there listening to the local talk, none of which was too much worthwhile to repeat right now, and the card games and all this. But the Rebbe was very happy that that's what he had. That was his form of pleasure. And it seemed to me out of character for the Rebbe to be interested that he goes to a place like a pool room, a billiard room. But to the Rebbe, he recognized for that particular person that was the right fit for what was needed representing his breadth of thought and his breadth of considering who he's talking to. I can tell you that it's been my experience that you know very few people have that set kind of sensitivity. You know, we abide by rules or formalities, even in the religion, where we sometimes are not willing to step out a little bit to accommodate a certain situation. But the Rebbe was, and I can tell you some other examples. You know, the Rebbe read everyone's letters. You know, people don't realize what a volume of letters he got until you see the bags being schlepped in 
the 770 and Rebbe Krinsky driving the Rebbe to the Ohel to read the letters. But you know, reading letters in the, in, the, in the winter months involves hours of time and you can't get it done before the sun's setting. And yet the Rebbe is reading letters before he deepened up. The Rebbe opened up his own letters in the, at least the beginning, correct? I think so. I, I don't know the mechanics. I, I don't know that part. It hurts to give an authority to, but I can tell you, I know for a fact the Rebbe would often come back to 770 and then start dropping Mincha, and it was plenty dark outside. I don't recommend this as a general halacha, but well, hello. <laughs> but it was Rebbe's way of looking at, at things from a, from a human standpoint. I remember in a similar vein, he once brought in a young Bacher who had let his grandparents stand on a freezing corner at Kingston in 770 and, and the Eastern Parkway. They were supposed to be picked up for a doctor's appointment, but the boy wanted to make a mincha minion before he picked up his grandparents. And the poor people were almost frozen, apparently you know, frozen their tracks by the by the weight they had to make for the grandson. So the Rebbe had a conference with the Rebbe, the grandson, that it, it would be better to have picked up your grandparents than go for the mincha minion. Um, and he wasn't telling him not to dab mincha on time. He was telling him that the human need arose, that God would wait for the mincha better than the suffering older people or the people who didn't understand why their letter wasn't being answered in a timely manner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not giving this as advice to the whole crowd to make your own rules and call your stockbroker on Shabbos because the, the stock went down. It, to tell you that sometimes you have to weigh in what are people's needs that your creator will, will, will factor in and why you had to make a modification of how you did something to help someone else who was in need. It's not a it's not loose to be taken loosely. I don't want to be misquoted or misunderstood on mentioning this story, and I don't want people to think they can make their own rules. I think the Rebbe says that in certain cases, you have to, to help someone who's in need, even before. And he challenged me, because I was he was asked by one of his Hasidim who met with him, he said, Dr. Weiss always comes so late to the visit to the office. We're already there two hours before he comes to see us on, on time. He said, well, so the Rebbe called me and said, Dr. Weiss, how is it that you always are so late for the patients? I said, Rebbe, you know, there's always a second set of rounds in the in the intensive care unit and a lot of things that come up that I, I can't plan. And I always want to do my mincha before I see the patients. He said, you daven mincha? I said, I've been daven mincha since I was six years old. I said, but you daven mincha before seeing the patients who are waiting? I said, yes. He said, he, uh, he didn't approve of that. He said, don't keep people waiting. He said, then you'll daven mincha when, when you made everyone feel less uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's not a license. I'm not giving this as a license to make your own rules. And it's certainly not a license to be your own Rebbe or, or, or not a license to steal and modify the halakha, but it's to accommodate the human needs that sometimes fit in just as Especially much. Especially in case of health, emergency. In case of health, in case of health and well being, or just plain old fashioned kindness. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a hard balance, but you have to be careful not to step out too far, to make your own. You know, you're not, we're not Rebbe's, let's face it. <laughs> we don't have his level of judgment. Who's a young lady, Rabbi Hertz, who's in your lap? Youngest daughter. Oh, hello. <laughs> you know, school. Yeah. Young to you know, I mean, my older kids, you know, but you know. Dr. Weiss, I want to ask you a question as follows. Um, the, 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 um, when the Rebbe actually, the book which, which the Rebbe had in his desk and originally, which I think is an unbelievable thing, think of the story that Chassidim actually, that, that they sent the Rebbe a gift, which Michal, the Rebbe wanted us to give things to, you know, they wanted to know what's going on, which that led to the event. I know the the book was about, uh, it was your, it was the first book you wrote on um, on um, how to do a, I think you once told me, right? I, I, I'll say, but I don't want to hit you. Uh, it, 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 was a, it was a book, I, I was not yet married and I took upon myself to write a book on the logic that one uses, the sort of mathematical logic you use to look at a complex cardiogram that has a very irregular rhythm pattern and make heads or tails of what is this rhythm pattern. It's kind of like a, you know, an engineering book on how to think logically about something that's very complex and break it down into its components so that you can make heads or tails. And it happened that I wrote the book uh, not even recognizing that the year before I wrote the book, the integrated circuit was patented by Texas Instruments. And this led to the miniaturization of computers. So from that point on, the late 1960s, early 1960s. So it was very innovative, correct? It was, it was innovative. I didn't, I didn't recognize it at that. And I didn't recognize the technology was being developed to utilize the book. So the book became kind of a, 
a, a major source book, or you might say the, a Bible for the engineers who were trying to develop computer programs that would quickly recognize abnormal heart rhythms immediately and sound an alarm and a patient being monitored in a hospital. And the book widely sold. It got wonderful reviews for clinicians in the New England Journal of Medicine. We, and I didn't know anyone who wrote these reviews. I wasn't like in on the end team and they were writing it, owing me a favor. They wrote a review for the book. They wrote wonderful reviews. So the book went through three printings. But there, there always was a lot of interest in the book, right? Yes, the book had many values. First of all, I, I at that time was a faculty member at Harvard and I, wrote, I, I was at Harvard Hill where I davened. So they invited me to host the Kiddish in honor of the book's publication. And at that Kiddish, I met my wife and the rest is history. We, we got married uh, a few months later and that was, that was my wife and it was a very, very successful marriage. And then the book attracted- Very special to, woman. And, thank you. And the book attracted notice of, of uh, Rabbi Schusterman, who I sent it to just to as a nachas. You know, he's my cheder teacher all my life and his wife was my cheder teacher, the wonderful inspiration. I just want to see, show him what a student of his was writing. So he decided that better than his desk would be something he would send to Rabbi Krinsky who could show the Rebbe what one of the Talmudim in a, in a good as Chabad Cheder was writing years later. So the Rebbe took a look at the book and re recognized it was a mathematician's delight to just look at the logic. And he didn't know cardiology, but he was very interested in how you decipher these complex spaghetti noodle looking cardiograms into logical patterns of arrhythm, arrhythmia. So he kept the book in his office. And his office was, as, the, as those who've been in his study, was kind of a small office. So it was one of the books on his shelves. I was very amazed that it had been sitting on his shelf all these years. And it was something that was in the mind of Rabbi Krinsky um, to even think of calling upon me in the first place, because I was, you know, in Timbuktu, and the Rebbe was really sick and needed more immediate help. Uh, although, as I said before, the initial call was really an ethics question. Was it correct to move the Rebbe in a semi-conscious state against his will. And I said, it probably isn't correct ethically, even though I didn't know the Rebbe and I didn't know, now that I know the Rebbe a little bit better, I said, for sure, you don't, you wouldn't violate his request on this. That, that today is the philosophy in general, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, another fascinating piece was that when you were a child, um, you, you mentioned this in public, so I'll say that your parents couldn't afford other schools and you landed out in Bnei Ruvain. So you see sometimes you take in a child, you give them a chinuch, and this led to actually, um, being for the Rebbe in an unbelievable way, which is an inspiration to everyone who has uh, Moistes and, and Shluchim worldwide and, and institutions. You do a little favor and you don't know where it c carries. I mean, you think about it for a second. Besides for yourself, what it did for the entire world. Well, okay, it's, it's, the story is even more uh, interesting because we were going to a, sh a little show in Edgewater called the Gudas Achim. And my grandmother, who was wanting me to come with her to show uh, from age five, onward, even though I love to play with my friends in the street on Shabbos, but she was telling me, you've got to come with me to Shul. So we went to Shul, and it was a crowd. It was a Yom Tov, or a Rosh Chodesh, uh, uh, Shabbos Mavorchim or something. The place was packed with women and the women's mechitzah, where I went with my grandmother. And my grandmother was a shorty, and most of the women were normal size. And everyone in those days wore big hats. And so by the time we were sitting behind all these women with their big hats and their you know taller dimension, we couldn't see a thing. So she asked if we could get a better seat and someone said, we can't accommodate you. Oh, oh it, was, it, was Rosh, it was Rosh Hashanah where you buy the tickets. We can't change the seats, Mrs. Fenchel, because you know people bought these seats, they belong to the show. We were not wealthy enough to belong to the show. So she said, well, I, I'm not seeing anything. I can't see anything over the hats of the women. So we decided to walk one block over to Gudas Kabad, one street over, and that, that's where it all started. <laughs> The hats were too big, the seat was too remote, and my grandmother was too short. And, and that motto is the Chabad motto for everything, which is uh, one soul, one, one is shaman at a time, one change at a time, everyone's welcome. That's the, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so the story can, is a story which you see. It's so much like that in real life, so many times over and over again. Can I ask you also about your phone calls with the Rebbe? Did the Rebbe ever go on the phone call? And how, how long were the phone calls every night? I never talked to the Rebbe on the phone, I think, at all. The phone calls were about a half hour. They, they got right to the point, but we first had to go over the Cubs ball, ball scores. And the Rebbe also knew that I was an avid bicyclist. I, I've made the rule of always living within seven miles of where I work. So my commuting was not by car, it was by bicycle. And it was also a way by which I could get in on Shabbos. 
uh, when it was a medical necessity without turning on a car, I would get there by bicycle, which I felt was a, you know, something that violated fewer rules on Shabbos when, when it was necessary. I didn't do this routinely. But in the course of the years, I put on 150,000 miles of commuting by bicycle. In the 50 years, I, I commuted um, about uh, 33,000 miles a year for the 50 years. So the Rebbitson was very concerned, like a mother would be concerned. Dr. Weiss, there's going to be snow in Chicago tomorrow. Dr. Weiss, isn't it a little cold to be go, going bicycling when it was sub-zero? I said, Rebbitson, my wife thinks of everything. She puts me in the right kind of clothing. I, I find it a challenge, but a, 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 an enjoyable challenge. So she would always try to act like a mother, saying, isn't it a little too cold? Isn't it a little too rainy? Isn't it a little too this and that? And I said, nah. <laughs> so we'd go into some personal details. And she would be very, very kind. And she was so kind to my children. She gave Hanukkah guilt. And one, one year, she didn't remember the name of the little one. So she said, a happy Hanukkah, baby. And it was just crazy. I still have that check in my, in my treasured possessions. We, of course, didn't cash it. We just love the, the signature on the check and the, and the little word to the happy Hanukkah, baby. Bit comma baby. It was very sweet. And um, once the little baby that we're talking about smashed a lot of china in the china cabinet while we were sitting in the parlor talking to the Rebbitson. And the Rebbitson didn't even scream or holler or raise an eyebrow. She said, that's a sweet baby. She's going to be very, very bright. And of course, she did fulfill the Rebbitson's promise. And she loved it. She was a curious baby, like the little story about Curious George, the, the fairy tale little book. This was Curious Becky. <laughs> and Becky, I know I'll tell, some... you, tell them more thing about Becky. So the Rebbit was turning 80. Uh, and we had a big birthday celebration. The place was packed and everyone's pushing and pushing towards the study to get a view of the Rebbe as he walked out on his 80th birthday for the Farbrengen and the Rebbe and the Yudal of uh, and Farbrengen. And he comes out and there's little Becky with me at my side. And she looks up to him with her little eyes and said, happy birthday, Rabbi. And everyone just howled with laughter. <laughs> it made everyone at peace. Um, Dr. Weiss, there's a question. I, I want to ask you three points, maybe if you can elaborate on. Number one, um, you're definitely, you consider yourself a chassid. When did that happen? When did that moment happen of being a chassid the Rebbe? I think when the Rebbe fulfilled my request to get Rabbi Mandel, Mangel to do a great translation of the Siddur, I became a much better davener, and I realized there's so much so much in the content of the prayers and the structure of the prayers. I said, really, I, I want to be really someone who attends to this in the proper manner, not just reading some Hebrew that's half understood and half not understood. And Mangel's translation, as I say, was such a remarkable way. It was a work of art, it, it's a literature art, if you ever really look at it in detail. Um, and it was even commented in the forward to the translation of how he changed sometimes tenses, uh, a person has changed first person to second to third in one sentence and why that's necessary. And when you thought about it, you thought a lot more about the prayer. And the Rebbe you spent one, also a lot of time for Brengans. You were there, a lot, of, a lot of for Brengans, you were there. I felt I felt in sync with the spirit of the people there. I was, first of all, very involved with the Rebbe and the Rebbitson. I was very involved with the Rashag in, in uh, Rebbitson Hana. And I was also attending to some people in the, in the Chabad community who had medical needs that you know kept me actively engaged. But most of all, I was really felt a brotherhood in the Farbrengens and the joy of dancing. The ability to dance like all night without getting tired was partly the attachment. And even now, I'll tell you, some of the old friends I've made still remember me. I remember them very well. Uh, we're separated by time and distance, but we're very close in our hearts. Can I ask you, you remember the Simchas Taira Toshim and Ches, which is 88. Um, the Rebbe then danced like this the first of a couple of long periods of time. I know you were there. Yes. And the energy was like that. That Simchas Torah is very remembered in Lubavitch in the later years. Do you recall anything about that Simchas Torah? Well, I always get nervous when the Rebbe puts out too much like that. But but I but I I, I if you can prime my memory a little bit, maybe you'll help me recall some of the details that you. The Rebbe turned to you a few times at a time, and yeah, he asked you. Something. Okay, you know, I remember that. So. Yeah, well, there was a lot of there was a lot of contact um, that I remember, um, but I don't remember a specific um, extraordinary incident. You know, I, I remember the, the energy, as you mentioned, 
but if you can prime me even a little bit better than that. Oh, no can I ask you a question? What does Rishchidosh Kislev mean to you today? You know, we all, we all, how does it, what does it mean to you today? Explain a little more about that. I, I look back on it as something that represents a very good effort on the part of five doctors who work cooperatively with one, with one another and being guided by the secretariat so nicely and having a Rebbe who was such a cooperative patient with his wife who was so understanding. Um, I haven't been able to emulate that success in real practice in, in real life in Chicago. I've had amazing stories to tell that were inspired by my caring for the Rebbe, but I think Rosh Kodesh Kislev is having put me on track for a different way of practicing even cardiology. For example, I'll give you an example. One of my patients in Chicago was a person who was the top musician in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And he had very extensive heart disease that obviously mandated some type of intervention. And all the doctors in town were at that time were doing open chest bypass surgery for such problematic patients. But I recognized that all the patients going through that surgery lost a little bit of their brain power, often unmeasurable, but it, they weren't quite like I had known them before the surgery. And I said to myself, here's a man who, if he lost one brain cell, wouldn't be this top of the world mus musician in his field. It's kind of like we had a basketball player in Chicago named Michael Jordan, who was the champion basketball player for the world. And he's a legend. I said, if Michael Jordan lost one of those brain cells, uh, he wouldn't be able to do what he does. Whereas I could lose a lot of brain cells and sort of, uh, not even by pretending, but actually by, by performing at a decent level could do my work. And so I said to myself, this musician can't afford to lose even a brain cell. If I don't do the surgery, he might not have the longevity the other patients have, but I'm gonna tell him that if he obeys all the rules that he can and has some good luck and God is on his side, he'll retain his position as a musician and not be embarrassed by being asked to step down. And his wife and he agreed with my strategy. I was actually summarily dismissed from the Chicago Cardiology Club, which is a insider's club where we have shared cases. I was regarded as doing something so horrifically stupid. But you know, this patient, whose name I can't mention, but this patient is still alive. He's in his 90s. He had a full career in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He didn't have that surgery. He rebuilt his arteries all by himself because of my convi conviction that he would try that hard. I had a steel company executive who owns a major steel company do the same thing with his arteries because he refused to submit the surgery. And he had a dog who took him for a walk, no matter how bad the weather was, the dog was very spoiled. The dog was very smart and knew he was torturing his master to walk, but those walks really forced him to get alternative rooting for, heart, for his heart arteries. And it was a more long-term solution than a more short-lived I, that, that's why you saw the energy of the Chassidim. I, I don't know if you, you were not the actual Rosh Chodesh Kislev. You were that way because... I was, in, I was in Chicago. I got the report. Oh, yeah, you, you were then in Chicago. But you saw the energy of Chassidim yeah. and the excitement and everything else. How do how were you swept into that, that whole piece? I, I was so happy to be part of it. <laughs> I, it was automatic pilot. You, you got swept in because the spirit was there. And it was with the Rebbe. And it's something that just can't be described to anyone who has never been there. Did they ever discuss to you about the chassid and the energy and the simcha? Did they ever discuss that with you? Because ever, you know, we we I think the Rebbe figured this is part of the part of part of the scene, and and we never discussed how it is this way. Why why is it this way? I never even asked him how did people develop all these songs. The the sefer and the gunim is this thick, and the, the gunim are so great, and they're being written every year. A new nigun for the Rebbe's birthday, and this and that, all kinds of other new, new nigunim. I said, how is it that, that this group of Obavich has so many better songs than I've heard anywhere else when I've been davening at different you know, Orthodox shows? And, and I, I said that really there's some spirit that just, they either were gifted or have created for themselves through the attachment to the Rebbe. It's, um, it's, it's kind of magical. <laughs> if I define it too much, I would take away the magic. Did you ever have a discussion that ever on any of the sikhs I ever spoke about, or was more medical? I, no, we did. I, I, I didn't go into depth because I wasn't as learned as many people are in, in Chabad, but I was very taken one, one year, the Rebbe described the, the Arba Minim, and he described the personalities that they represent. And I was very attracted to the idea that you are bringing together the Arba Minim 
is a representation in a sense of bringing together people from all kinds of walks and backgrounds and capabilities, some with limitations, some with talents, and still bringing them together. And I said, this is such an important lesson in life, how to get, how to, how to preserve life, how to preserve a community, how to preserve the world. And it's a theme of Lubavitch that's, that's not just talked about, but it's enacted, enacted on a daily basis, that it takes the four species to get the work done. You can't just do it with just Lulavim or just with Esrogim. And you spoke to them about it? I talked to him. I said how meaningful it. He, he had given, there was once a series called Sichas in English where the Rebbe, the certain Sichas of the Rebbe were translated in a very, you know, in a very beautiful way for those of us who have a command of one language like me. And the Sichas in English, I enjoy, always read all of them, but the Sichas in English about the Arba Minim was one of the ones I enjoyed and brought up to the Rebbe. And another one I was, was once on, on Tasha Yisro, where he talked about all the people who were assembled at Sinai and how they were of one mind, even though they were all diverse natures. And I, the theme is prevalent in the, in the whole way of Lubavitch function. So really, we're made up of a, a really of a great amalgam of all kinds of talents and all kinds of personalities, some stronger, some weaker, but that's all part of the equation. And they ever told you things while you spoke to them? Or like, like they ever, you had a conversation on, this, on a sikha? Or? No, I didn't, we, we, we didn't have the time. A lot of my visits were really to make sure that the river was attended properly medically. And a part of it was that we, we had it also just, you know, like, like conversational talk, like, like friends are talking. Uh, the Rebbe took me in as a, a friend and member of his family almost. <laughs> you, ate, you, ate, you ate dinner with the Rebbe's table many times, right? One time, I, I would not recommend that. I would not recommend that for the weak of heart because you feel so be, below the level of the Rebbe and Rebbeson. And, and sitting there, I was way out of place. I, it was like bringing me before the king. I, I don't belong at that table. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go there again. My brother, Howie, who's my younger brother, in 1957, when he was brought by his cater teacher to Chabad, saw the Rebbe first and actually sat with the Rebbe um, at a time of Pesach, he, they were at a common table. And to my brother, he said, well, the place was kind of dusty, you know, this and that. He was a little child and he didn't recognize what he was seeing. So he didn't have the same impression that he was in the wrong place. <laughs> I'll see you there one time. Oh. So one time. One time, Baruch Hashem, one time. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> No, it's a very, very inspirational talk. Um, maybe if anyone wants to ask any questions sure. on the uh, on, on the chat, I just want to also take the opportunity. Um, first of all, thank Dr. Weiss as we take questions. First, I wish you, uh, you, and your your wife, Aisha Schail, who's really, uh, you know, through thick and thin, has been the part of the story. Arichas Yom Veshan and Taivais and brachis and blessings and Shahab uh, Nachas from your wonderful family. And continue good health. You, you're really an inspiration, and we owe you so much. Rabbi, the world, Rabbi, the world you, owes you so much. You said you said you you raised the bar on those standards, and I want to thank you for what you've done for the Chicago community. And every time I've had occasion to observe your work, even though it's on a limited basis because of the work keep keep us apart, I would say that I would like to give you brachas at least at that level, if not higher. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think so, but I do want to say for one moment since I have the microphone. I want to wish my parents, it's really anything I have is a credit to my parents, and I want to wish them a brachas of Arich Hashem, Mashan, and Tyrus, and good health Amen. and happiness. I'm now talking to London, so it's their hometown, and they're welcome to for more than 50 years. So I want to wish them all the brachas. And uh, he's, I never told my father in, in, in doubt many times, Yarech Yom Amalachtai. So that brachas You're so privileged to have a father like that who is a, a, a kingpin of the whole society of the Jewish people community in London. I also, I also might want to also make mention that I felt so sad as all worldwide Jewry about the death of Jonathan Sachs, whom the Rebbe inspired to go the path of being a rabbinic leader. And I think when he talked to Jonathan Sachs on a private set of conferences, Jonathan Sachs confronted the same dilemma the Rebbe might have had because the Rebbe was so capable in secular studies and, and science and writing and engineering and all this, uh, I'm sure there must have been times when the river was as troubled as Jonathan Sachs was troubled about should he go this way or that way with, with God has 
privileged him to have with the talents that he had. So losing a talent like that, I don't know how much the Chabad community interacted with Jonathan Sachs, but certainly on a regular basis, you get a chance to read his articles and, and feel his impact and even reviewing the stories of his being with the Rebbe and being inspired to go this direction by the Rebbe. It's um, very meaningful stories about his contact with the Rebbe. And I'm sure for the whole community of England, it's uh, quite a loss. I also wanna just throw in that I'm uh, one quarter British. I have a, uh, my, 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 my paternal grandfather hailed from Great Britain. And um, I'm a hobbyist. The Rebbitson knows that I love model railroad trains. And some of my favorite trains are trains that were made in Great Britain 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, the Hornby trains, if any of you are model railroaders, uh, I'm a big fan of the British model railroads. So this is my connection to Great Britain. <laughs> I noticed earlier on the Zoom also Rabbi Shmuel Lou was on, which I feel sure you met in New York, mm -hmm. by the Rebbe. Sure. They, they were close to the, by the Rabbitson, I'm sure you've met. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, Rabbi Itzinger, we should maybe take some questions. Anyone wants to ask Dr. Weiss any questions? I'm reading here. Yeah. Did you ever hear from the Rebbe? Yeah. About people taking good reports. Um, what what is meant by the good reports? Can can you write a little bit more about what you mean so I can answer the question properly? So I would ask Mendel if he could just expand a little bit about the, on the question because I, I can't quite answer it because I don't quite perceive what the question is asking. Um, the question, I, I think the question was, uh, I, 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 oh, I, Rashid, as I thought it was, Rashi, uh, oh, oh, like, oh, oh. Oh, you know, because one of the things was right, ah. the, it said that Nachas threw out, they never wanted to hear always good news and not only come for the problems. So, well, I think I think part of his rapport was being able, being privileged to read those letters, and getting news like that was better than the medicines we were shooting into him uh, by a country mile. It was really something that the Rebbe told me about. He said that he had heard this. I think there was someone who achieved some kind of scientific accomplishment that he wanted to discuss with me, and he was, and I told him that this seems to have great merit to, to fit into something that was needed at the time, and the Rebbe was so happy to hear. To hear this, he was really, it was like truly the best medicine for him, better than you this. actually see a time when you by the Rebbe when some news came in. Our stories circling around, like certain times I was happy. Uh, recently, um, the Rebbe was had a certain simcha different times. Did you see that with the Rebbe when reports came in, when certain moments that I was happy? I wasn't, I wasn't part of that. Um, contact with the Rebbe, where I would know on a day-by-day -day basis when something turned one way or the other. Um, I mean, well, I was in contact medically with the Rebbitson about the Rebbe's progress, but I didn't actually get a chance to see such, um, you know, joy or satisfaction or sometimes even dismay if it's the other way around. So I, I can't answer that, uh, that I ever... Could I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, the question is that uh, we heard or well, some people heard that when the Rebbe was um, with the Oilam and uh, people were coming up for Kreshul Brocha, for instance. If you can just excuse me, I just have to take a call. I'll be right back. This will take one second just to take care of. I'll, I'll take your question in one second. Okay, so we've unmuted everybody now, and you're welcome to put your questions forward. And of course, Rabbi Shakastacher, you go first. Thank you very much, Reb Getzel. Since you have the whitest beard and you look the most uh, extinguished. <laughs> and I probably said the most l'chaim already. I, I mean, he's not on the... Now, I just want to say one thing. I know dynamics. One of his partners I recently met two years ago. <laughs> when, when Dr. Weiss left his, came to New York, he had a brand new practice and he left for weeks. So his partners basically uh, dissolved the practice and it was caught as a lot of Agmas Nefesh. So I, I met two years ago, one of those partners who dissolved the practice. And he said that if he would have known who the Rebbe was, Lachreina, 
he saw all the unbelievable books and he read, I think he read, um, I imagine he, one, of, one of the books came out, he read from cover to cover and he basically said that he didn't understand who the Rebbe was. He would have insisted to keep the practice together. But it's interesting that at that time, the mysterious nefesh she had was unreal. I mean, he basically gave everything up and, he's, and, and his family was not, I mean, it was a total uh, shift in his life and he came for the Rebbe. So the schus is like unre- unbelievable. And from when he came, things started to change and turn around. So that's just a, an interesting piece on, on, the, on the whole equation. So Bechlal, and I'm saying, you see, you see that the interesting thing I want to say also is that we see what a skashras means. I mean, for the Rebbe, when we saw the skashras, a posh, the word from the Rebbe is unbelievable. I know once that one time at night, and I, he, um, someone came at an emergency question and came to the, and came to the um, Rebbe's house and the Rebbe said, answer the door and she took the question to the Rebbe. The person then, I heard this from the, from the person, through the person himself, started asking a pirish on the answer. And the Rebbeton kept on, first of all, she, he apologized when we came all the night and she was very like, Mechlal, very gracious and Mechlal didn't uh, make a big deal out of it. And when the person said the answer, the, the Rebbeton kept on saying, Azoyot among the Zacht. She didn't deviate from a word the Rebbe said, didn't add an explanation, didn't add, didn't moisif on the word and gerei on the word. And this is an unbelievable thing, Mechlal, which we, you know, we're talking now at a time that we want to instill in skashas in ourselves, and it's a, it's a time of the most imp- important thing to realize that the words of the Rebbe are Rebbe's real, and we start putting in our own das atzmoy, our own seichel, our own logic, that's when we sort of, we go wrong. We start taking the words, we do it right. I want to just expand on that. I don't want to be misquoted in, in light of what Rabbi Hirsch just said. I don't want to be misquoted for saying that I, you make up your own rules. I think or to misquote the Rebbe, what the Rebbe had in mind. So I want you to be assured that that you follow the rules of not only our Torah and our teachers and our Rebbeim, but also that you you keep in mind that the Rebbe, you know, would make these exceptions sometimes to the actual strict application of rules in the circumstances that demanded for protecting life or protecting, you know, protecting a situation where someone could be suffering unnecessarily as a human being or as a sick person or something when someone doesn't, you know, when applies rules that would make them sick, more sick or something like this. The, 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 um, it's just a matter of, I, I didn't hear the whole conversation, so maybe I'm not speaking correctly from what was being discussed just now. I'm just filling in time, but yeah. the, back, back to his question, Dr. Weiss. Um, so uh, he, he had a question, Kastler. Yeah, when I first came to the Rebbe, which was the year after, um, the year after uh, Lamed Ches, um, people were saying, in fact, I'm not going to mention names who said, that people shouldn't go up to the Rebbe to take the Koshul Bracha and to take this and that. And then I heard that, um, that coming from the doctors, the doctors were saying that when a person came up to the Rebbe, his heart, uh, what's his name, his heart monitors, rhythm, yeah. came, came, came back to almost normal. I actually saw, I actually did witness that, that sometimes when he had a little bit of irregularity of the rhythm in the course of a long farbrengen, and then when Kosho Bracha was being given, he was in a much better frame of mind, maybe Maybe it was something that really did help him in a direct way. Thank you. I heard also a story about a, a syringe. Did you have a conversation with the Rebbe about a syringe? You know, I've read that in a book and I didn't ever remember the conversation. I, it, there was a book uh, published, I think, in Canada, maybe in the Montreal Jewish community, published a book. And I saw the story and about how the syringe and how the vacuum in the syringe works. But I, I have to say, I, I, can't, I can't confirm that I ever remember such a, um, a discussion with the Rebbe of how the, how the vacuum is what draws the fluid. So the answer is I can't, I can't confirm it. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> You're a wonderful person. We well, appreciate the audience being so, <laughs> so attentive. I, 
just hope that I didn't bore you to tears with all these stories. Not at all. It was amazing. Any other questions? Well, I wish everyone a good Yom Tov. And this is a series of Yom Tovim, the Kinas Hashluchim and the Rosh Chodesh Kislev. And we should build up our spirit and continue to be strong in this world. I will just give you one little word that I heard from Professor Herman Bronover, the Hasid of the Rebbe. He's a physicist based in Israel, Russian-born physicist based in Israel, who my wife and I had the privilege of meeting when his wife was living. We met his wife as well. There was a period of time when the Rebbe was running into some problems. And my father, of course, as I mentioned, was running into some problems and this and that. And I was saying that, I, I said to Dr. Branovar, I said, it's amazing how many things are going wrong all at one time. And it's hard to handle all this that's going wrong. And Herman Branover turned around and said, Dr. Weiss, it's not how many things are going wrong, it's how many things that are going right for this world to even exist and for the things that are being continued in the structure of the world. I think his answer was right, not only as a physicist would answer a question, but really we should look upon it this way, even when so many things in the world, in the structure of the world, the condition of the world, the condition of the people of the world are having troubles, we should look at how many things have to be going right for this world to be maintained. And I would tell you that I think Chabad and movements like Chabad, which try to make people work together in cooperation are among the things that are really going right in this world. So I wish you all a good Yom Tov. And thank, thank you, you for inviting me. Thank you, Rabbi Hartson. My regards to your father and his continue his good work and love to the whole family. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And it means a lot um, that you uh, spend this afternoon in your busy schedule to uh, my hometown. And uh, it's a, I, I'm sure it was very special to the whole audience here. And again, I'm sure Lubavitch around the world and including Lubavitch, the whole community in London, also thank you for the dedication and your, 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 your gifts you gave to the Rebbe, which is the gifts read to Kal Yisrael, to Chabad, obviously, but to Kal Yisrael, to every Jew in the world. And it's changed the landscape, you know, that, 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 that decision which you made, which is, uh, you know, and I think in life, I just want to say, Dr. Weiss, in life, we all get opportunities in life. Sometimes one, Vashanta says, one thing come our way. I'm, not, I'm sure you've done many things in your life, and I'm not taking away the many culture, but you get sometimes a thing comes away, a, a Jew, a need, as the Rebbe taught us, a myth says something, and we can either seize the moment or miss the moment. You showed us what it means, seizing the moment, and today we're here, Baruch Hashem, here to celebrate this unbelievable moment. It's true, we're out to give more talents, but at the same time, this moment is special to us, and it's, it's Giluyim, and which was like to, uh, to again celebrate that moment again with the rabbit together. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.